Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello and welcome to episode 29 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. Today's episode features an interview with Canadian author Terry Fallis. Terry is a two-time winner of the Stephen Leacock Medal for Humor, the winner of CBC Canada Reads for the Essential Novel of the Decade, the winner of the CBA Libris Author of the Year Award for 2013, which I did have the absolute great honor of presenting to Terry personally on stage back when I was president of the Canadian Booksellers Association. And Terry's also had a six-part miniseries based on his first novel, appear on CBC television. Terry is the co-founder of Thornley Fallis, a full-service consulting agency with offices in Ottawa and Toronto. For about 30 years, he's counseled corporate and government clients, written speeches for CEOs, cabinet ministers, and other community leaders. Now, apart from Terry's amazing literary accomplishments, he's a genuine and all-around nice guy. He's down-to-earth, self-effacing, a man of integrity, charm, and quick wit. It is always a pleasure when I get to hang out with Terry. I am honored to consider him a friend, even if it's due to a contract I made him sign and commit to when he was still an up-and-coming author. (laughs) And I'm delighted to share this great chat with Terry on the Stark Reflections podcast. I always find conversations with Terry to be so entertaining, informative, and always inspiring. Before we get to that and to my personal update... I want to get to today's tongue twister, which is inspired from recently re-watching the remake of Stephen King's It. And yes, it's the phrase that Bill says to help with his stutter. Twisted by the, twisted by the, twisted by the, twisted by the, twisted by the fool, twisted by the fool, twisted by the fool. Such a fool. All right, here is this episode's tongue twister. Amidst the mists and fiercest frost, with barest wrists and stoutest boasts, he thrusts his fish against the posts, and still he... Okay, I can't do it. All right. He thrusts his fists against the posts, and still insists he sees the ghosts. Wow. It seems so much easier when you, you hear Bill say it, or you read it in the Stephen King novel. Now, the last two lines of this poem are used effectively in the original novel by King. It's used quite a bit, and it's a powerful um, tool against Pennywise the Clown. Now, the latest movie adaptation only uses it in a few brief scenes, but many folks have heard the he thrusts his fists against the posts and still insists he sees the ghosts. Now, this is a phrase that stuck with me since having first read it when I was a teenager. And and I'd read somewhere that somewhere that those lines are from a poem called Drunkard, uh, which kind of makes sense when you think about hallucinations either from alcohol or from the detox of uh, the cold turkey process. Now, this tongue twister segment of the show is sponsored by Find Away Voices. If you're tired of thrusting your fists against the posts and are looking for a solid solution for creation and distribution of audiobooks where you are in control, check out Find Away Voices at starkreflections.ca. Slash find away. Such a fool. And now, here's this week's personal update, which merges into an extensive reflection, I have to admit. I'm a victim of my own imagination and creativity, and, and the hundred new ideas that hit me every single day, 99 of which I need to throw out. Now, I've lived with this affliction my entire life, but it can be frustrating, particularly since many times it feels like that new project or writing idea is yet another bright shiny object that'll distract me from getting anything done. I'm talking about feeling overwhelmed. When I left my full-time employment in November of 2017, I had imagined I would have more time for writing. I was spending half my time writing and the other half doing consulting and coaching, which were the elements for my previous jobs that I enjoyed so much. But little did I know that 
the work involved in that, as well as in, in this podcast and a few of the other creative projects I've been engaging in, would end up taking more time than initially planned. Meaning there are writing projects I've been pecking away at, but I am nowhere near where I initially planned to be when looking at the year 2018, when it was ahead of me. I'm sure that many authors feel this way, particularly at this time of year, the, you know, the midpoint of the year. So the year is half over. I feel like I have barely accomplished the things I had originally intended. And I certainly have more unfinished projects than I started with, and yet very few finished ones. At least that's how it feels, and that's how it leads to me feeling overwhelmed. Every time I look at the unfinished projects and the ongoing pile-up of projects that I keep adding to my own queue, combined with the already weekly tasks and schedule that keeps getting filled, oftentimes with projects that take a lot of time and return a, a modicum of income, I feel my head start to spin. And then I end up doing something useless, like falling down a rabbit hole of YouTube binge-watching, or, or even worse, scrolling through my Facebook feed and becoming distraught at the nature by which a world seems to be more divisive than ever before, with really good people constantly at each other's throats. Ongoing evidence screaming at me about the downfall of society that we just can't treat one another with respect any longer. And it continues to spiral down. But fortunately, Liz and I have gone on a couple of single night camping trips. You know, about a one and a half hour to two hour drive from uh, from our home. And uh, we've done that a couple times in the past couple of weeks. And those trips have helped tremendously. Though just a single night, we disconnected. We got back to nature. We enjoyed hiking and swimming and talking and hanging out with the dogs and, and doing a lot of reading. Now the first trip, we read the same nonfiction book. I, I spoke about it in um, the book, The Power of Moments, in episode 28. The trip this past week, Liz read a different nonfiction book while I read a novel by a friend, Amy Teagan, called No Day Like Today. It's a great novel. Uh, because between reading sessions, and we ended up sharing what we were learning and getting from each read. So she was talking about the nonfiction book she was reading, and I was getting excited about uh, Amy's novel and, and wanting to share with her how much I loved it. Um, it. It was a really great experience. But again, we disconnected, we read, we shared what we were reading about. It was a really great experience. But in a nutshell, the camping trip was a great refreshing escape that helped me recharge my batteries. So that was one thing that helped. Or number one in terms of three things that have helped me deal with the feeling of being overwhelmed and I wanted to share as part of my personal update because I'm pretty sure that you as a writer are probably feeling that as well. So number one is unplug. You know, tune it out and do something relaxing and enjoyable just for its own sake. So the camping trip in our example really helped me unwind. It helped me relax and come back with a fresh perspective. And again, it was only a single night so it wasn't a long trip but it did the trick. Now, it might not be camping for you, but it might just involve falling into some activity that you find relaxing and enjoyable and that can have a recharging effect on you. Whatever it is, don't deny yourself. Embrace it and use that moment to recharge and come back. Number two, list the things. Now, all the things that are overwhelming you... Um, they're overwhelming you because they're seemingly tumbling out of control. They're spiraling and you have no grasp on them. Sometimes just lining them up and understanding what they are allows you to see them in a new light and attack them in some sort of order. So for me, there's this large whiteboard that we mounted on the wall right beside my desk. On it, I listed the various tasks, the issues, the deadlines, the problems, the projects, and the items that I needed to attend to that were overwhelming me and making me feel overwhelmed and out of control. So instead of just scrolling on my Facebook feed and wasting precious time and getting frustrated with the idiocy that seems to be running rampant, I just turn my head to the right, to the whiteboard, and I look at what needs to be done. What deadline should come first based on drop-dead dates? And what could I cross off or remove from the whiteboard? Erase it. Or remove them from weighing on my shoulders at the same time. And with every single thing I crossed off or wiped off the board, I felt that much better and less out of control. Number three, list the things you have done. Now, I only started to do this, but I had to take note of the things that have been positive. 
to help me realize that while I'm not where I wanted to be, while I haven't achieved the things I'd planned on achieving by this time in the year, I have still achieved things that might not have been on the list. And some of them are good. Some of them were really welcome surprises. We get overwhelmed with the things we haven't done and the things we wanted to accomplish, but we rarely pause to acknowledge the good things that happened that were unexpected. So I'm going to give you a couple examples. For me, for example, this past weekend I had a table at Grain and Grit Brewery in Hamilton. This is part of a series of six Saturday local vendor community market pop-up events that I've committed to. I thought, why not invest in this and see what this could do for me as a writer? Now, it hasn't been hugely successful for me, though I only sold a single book this past week. And, you know, I'm there for four hours, five, six with the setup and the drive and everything. You know, that should have frustrated me because I only sold a single book after all this work. But I ended up having a few really interesting positive things happen in that afternoon. First, a woman approached my table and said, I just wanted to let you know I remember you from the Writing Show podcast. I was so excited to listen to another Hamilton area author. And we chatted for a little bit, and she asked me about the novel, A Canadian Werewolf in New York, which I had been working on when interviewed for this podcast. And this podcast I appeared on back in 2006. Now, I, I admitted to her that the novel, which... Um, uh, I failed to release in the series of podcast interviews she was talking about for the writing show by host Paula B, um, that I didn't actually end up finishing it until 2016. I actually put it aside for years and came back to it in 2014 slash 2015. I could have thought how I was an idiot who took 10 years to finish the project. I could have been reminded of that when I was talking to her. But instead, I allowed myself to be impressed by the fact that the interview, my interview, and, and my interview in which I revealed my ongoing failures as a writer, helped another writer somewhere. Now this let me know that, that there was a positive difference to her as a writer. Now many others I'm sure never get the chance to let me know. But the key is that some of the things that we do, some of the things we share, do make a positive difference to others. And it's okay to consider that a success when counting the things you have accomplished. Now, second, same afternoon, uh, a man who I'd met two weeks earlier at the same vendor fair, he bought one of my books. He approached the table and said, damn you. And I was like, what? I asked, you know, worried that, you know, my book was so bad I had offended him or I had wasted his time and money. He said, you made me enjoy the book so much, I can't wait to read the sequel. Tell me you've written the sequel. And he was talking about my thriller evasion. And this was a nano NaNoWriMo novel I, I wrote several years ago and released in 2014. I'd started to write the sequel in 2015, and I'm only 75% of the way through. I shared with him that the sequel is still in progress, and it's on a back burner somewhere, but I shared a few details about it, which he sounded uh, like he was eager to read. I mentioned I had also roughly conceived of what the third book would be in the overall three-book story arc of what I was calling the Desmond Files. I promised him that hearing from readers like him is further motivation to get me off my butt in working on finishing the sequel. I could focus on the fact that this is a reminder that I didn't get the thing done, and yeah, that's the first thing we tend to do to ourselves. But now I have him as another real person to consider when working on getting that done. He read the book. He wants to see what happens to the characters next. And while he wanted the sequel, he contented himself with buying another one of my thrillers. He bought a Canadian werewolf in New York. Now, I warned him that the sequel to that, Fear and Longing in Los Angeles, is another unfinished project. He laughed, bought the book, uh, and then he went inside to enjoy uh, a few beers at the brewery. Now, he actually came back out a half hour later to share an idea he had for the title of the third book in the Evasion Trilogy. It was a great idea. And one I wrote down, and I promised to credit him for, should I end up um, using that in the third book. But the idea struck me. There's this guy who was sitting in a bar enjoying some great craft beer, and he was actually thinking about, he was imagining fictional characters I had created, and he was coming up with ideas for them. I could remind myself of what I haven't done, or I could acknowledge that this is a pretty amazing and powerful thing. I could take all this and I could think about how I'm an idiot deadbeat author who hasn't finished multiple projects that I should have finished long ago. I could beat myself up over and over. I know as writers we often do this to ourselves. But instead, I decided to think about the positive, about what this means I have accomplished. 
Things I never set out to accomplish, but which happened. And things that are critical to the all-important element of writer and reader connecting in the long term. Let me leave this listing of three things that helped me with saying, as I look at the whiteboard while I'm recording this, I'm aware that I crossed three of the eight things off the list there. Yes, there are still five things weighing heavily on me, but I wanted to acknowledge the importance of having achieved three things in the past three days. And that's pretty solid. So stop beating yourself up over the perceived misses. Start acknowledging where you've made progress, however slight, however surprising, and however unplanned. Unplanned things can derail us, but unplanned things can also inspire and move us. And so those are my personal notes and reflections here. Let's get on with the interview with Terry Fallis, which I'm sure you'll find even more inspiring, as I always do. Hey, Terry, thanks for joining me on the podcast. Mark, always a pleasure. Nice to talk to you. So you are uh, just about to release, or you're working on your seventh book, I should say. Correct. Uh, which I'm so excited for. The, the Terry Fallis books, I have to say, I have to start this off by, uh, by kissing up and saying really nice things <laughs> about you. But you haven't written a book I haven't loved, and every book gets better and better. And it's one of the things that it doesn't matter what I'm reading, when it comes out, or when the audio starts coming out in advance of the book, I drop everything else and I go to Terry Fallis first. And that is, um, that, that's amazing. Wow, that's very kind of you. I'd like you to just come with me to all of my events and uh, introduce you. <laughs> introduce <laughs> me. That would be great. Just say that same thing. <laughs> um, but I'm going to go back to uh, when we first met. When we first met, I was working at the bookstore at McMaster University and you were a, uh, a graduate, a former graduate from McMaster, an alumna. Alumna, alumnus, alumni, is that the Alum, name? Alumnus is the singular, I think. There you go, alumnus, a male alumni. Or something like that. <laughs> That's right. That's okay. I've got dictionaries and things behind me, but I'm not going to... I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you had self-published a book, and you were interested in seeing if our bookstore was going to carry it. What brought you to that path where you were calling this, this guy and saying, would you please carry my book? How did, how did you get there? Well, and I'm very glad that I did pick up the phone and, and call you because it, uh, it was kind of an important moment in my life then as a self-published uh, writer. But I can tell you what uh, the process, and it's probably one with which independent writers are, are quite familiar. I, I wrote this novel, uh, probably not on a topic that one would ever counsel a rookie writer to write about <laughs> had they dreams of being published. But I wrote a satirical novel of Canadian politics, of all topics, because I thought I ought to write about something that I know about and that I care about, and I came out of that world. So I wrote this novel, and uh, you know, when I finished the manuscript, I didn't really know whether I had actually written a novel or not. Uh, I didn't know whether the story held together. I didn't know whether the characters were believable. I didn't know whether it was funny. I just had this faint inkling that it was finished. Uh, so I did what most writers do. I sent out uh, query letters and plot synopses and sample chapters and sometimes full manuscripts to dozens and dozens and dozens of literary agents and publishers uh, around uh, the country and into the United States. And, and then as we've probably, we've, I'm sure we've talked about this before, Mark, but I, then I sat back and I waited for the feeding frenzy to ensue over my debut blockbuster <laughs> novel. And uh, I waited and waited and diligently followed up. And after a year of doing that, I had not even received a single rejection letter. <laughs> so I hadn't, make a, I hadn't made a big enough impression on the traditional publishing establishment to generate an automated rejection letter. Uh, I did get one email from a literary agent who said, you know, you've, you've written this novel and I've read it. It's, it's, I quite like it. It's funny and it's good, but you wrote a satirical novel of Canadian politics. What were you thinking? <laughs> I couldn't possibly place this anywhere, but good luck to you. And uh, I sort of kept that email aside and it, it plays a role later down the road. But, uh, but I, I just, I thought that waiting a year and getting no response was uh, a, really big length of time, a long, long time 
I've come to learn that that's not actually that long in, in publishing terms, but I, in my naivete back then, there was no evidence to suggest that were I to continue those efforts, anything would change. So, and I didn't even think about self-publishing, but my, my wife, she said, why don't you just self-publish it and get it out there and sort of get it out of your system? And, uh, and, and I did. And uh, that's what brought me, well, there's another step in the way, which is the, uh, along the path, which is the podcast, which we can, we can talk about. But I'm not sure I actually would have pushed the big red button to self-publish were it not for the positive response I got to the podcast edition of it. But. Okay, and so this was, this was what, 2006, 2007? Yes, uh, I was, the year, the arid year spent pitching uh, was 2006. Okay. Uh, and I made the decision to self-publish in uh, literally the last couple days of the year of 2006. And I started uh, uh, recording and producing and promoting the podcast uh, in about the first week of January, 2007. <clears throat> okay. And, and I think I'll, I'll, I'll interject to say, uh, I think I'd received an email from you introducing the book. And again, I saw the subject and went, a satirical novel of Canadian <laughs> politics. I would rather read about golf, which I think is one of the most boring sports in the world. And I probably alienated half the listening it's, audience there. But <laughs> Mark, you're going to die when you find out what my next novel is about. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. But that kills me is I thought, okay, <laughs> I can't think of a more boring topic than Canadian right. politics. <clears throat> uh, wow. Uh, you know, excited that this guy's from McMaster and I, and I love <laughs> you know, stuff from, from, you know, uh, students and, and staff, et cetera. Um, and then I saw you had the podcast and I was huge into podcasts. You know, I started in, I think, 2004, 5, 6. Right. And um, I went, oh, he's got a podcast. What I'll do. And, and, and again, this is before the, I think even the iPhone existed. So you know, I downloaded <laughs> it to this little MP3 player. It kind of, you know, looked like one of these little jobbies. I remember them. I up to my phone and had to connect it with the cable. I said, well, he's got the, the, some episodes. So I'll download the, the, the prelude and, and chapter one and I'll listen to it. Because uh, where I parked at Mac was about a 15 minute walk across campus to like. We're the, in zone seven or zone yeah, six. The, the nosebleeds kind of yes. like across the highway. Exactly. So it was quite a beautiful <laughs> walk. You'd see deer and other animals, you know, in the early morning. And I started listening to it and I went, oh my God, this is riveting. And I remember thinking <laughs> two things. Robertson Davies, one of my favorite, one of my favorite uh, novelists. Um, my favorite book of his is, is, is Dark Humor, Ghost Stories at Christmas Time. Yes. High, High Spirits. Spirits. And, and there's that humor, but then the humor of John Irving in his prayer for Mo and Meany days and all of those, I was like, oh my God, this guy has the voice of two of my favorite authors. <laughs> By the time I got to my car, I was like, oh, I'm going to call Terry tomorrow morning. I, we got to do a book signing. It's going to be awesome. I can't wait to have him here. This is going to be a huge blockbuster book. And so it was the podcast and you were actually amazing reading. I hadn't realized you had professional experience doing voice stuff. Mm. Um, so the podcast is what hooked me. Let's well, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. Why that you was, did that? Well, I, it's funny. I, I, I did it because as a, you know, a PR and, and marketing guy for my day job in almost 30 years now in the agency world, I certainly knew that the greatest uh, problem with self-publishing is that nobody's going to market the book for you. Uh, nobody's going to carry it in bookstores. Uh, unless you are diligent. Uh, and I knew that I needed to build an audience for this this novel on my own. And I thought I would, uh, uh, I would podcast the novel. I got the idea from an article I read in the New York Times uh, about a writer named Scott Sigler. And you probably know Scott Sigler well, because your, your two genres that you write in aren't that far apart, really. I had been listening to Scott's podcast as well. I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure. And, uh, and he had this idea of just giving it away for free in the hopes that he'd gather enough listeners around him to impress a publisher. And I thought, well, I mean, why don't I try that? What have I got to lose? I didn't know that nobody in Canada had, had done it yet, but uh, uh, sometimes ignorance is, uh, is bliss. So I just, I decided to give the whole thing away for free. Uh, and the theory is that if you give it away for free in one format, uh, it might come back to you in sales in another format. So I wouldn't have given the written word away for free. 
but I was quite happy to give away the audio version for free. And I'm convinced that over the years we have sold more books because we've given the audio version away for free. Okay. And so that is something, so that, that was sort of, that was the start because you had captured people from around the world, right? It wasn't just Canadians. Strangely, that, that is true. I mean, uh, I, I was not even convinced that I would find many listeners in Canada who might be interested in listening to a novel about Canadian politics. So it was a great shock to, to get emails and blog comments and tweets uh, from people in other parts uh, of the world who somehow had stumbled upon it in the, usually I think in the iTunes podcast literature listings. And there is a separate literature section in, uh, in <laughs> iTunes. Uh, and really, I, uh, Mark, I don't even know if I would have finally gone ahead and self-published it were the comments not so uh, gratifying and, and surprisingly <laughs> positive from the people who listened to it. The only negative comments I got were people who complained about having to wait a week before the next chapter was posted. Uh, <laughs> or how you pronounce the scotch. Oh, that's true. Good on you, Mark. You like, a vo- like a Vulan, like a... <laughs> yes, I, I was... You corrected it, too. I know. I, I, uh, I can't remember what it was, but I got an email from a guy in, who lived in the highlands of, of Scotland who said he's loving the novel, and, but I was, it's not pronounced Lego Vulan, it's pronounced Lego... Or maybe it is Lego Vulan. I said Lego Volan. Anyway, I like, mispronounced yeah. it and he corrected it. <laughs> it was, you know, that's the kind of insight you get from the community that you can uh, create through a, a podcast. <laughs> Which is kind of amazing. And, and, and I think one of the other things that was a huge benefit is because you have a, a good voice and because you had the control, because you had done the PR marketing podcast, you understood right. the, the, the basic technology involved. Yes. I think it, it, as, I, as I'm looking at the video here, it looks like you're, you're sitting in the location where I believe you stand when you dictate your novels. Is that correct? Actually, uh, no. Uh, I, I'm not at home. I'm actually in oh. my, day, my day job office <laughs> uh, where I still work four days a, a week. Um, uh, but no, I record in the third floor of our home where we built okay. a library, but it, there are bookshelves in the background. Okay. It looks so. very similar. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. My apologies. <laughs> That's all right. I, I, I want to come back to the podcast itself because I'm quite impressed with how that has continued. But I want to also, um, for folks who don't know your story, I want to say, okay, so you've got the podcast out, you've decided to publish the, self-publish the book, right? Uh, and then some pretty remarkable things happened. Obviously, you did a lot of work, but let's kind of take it back to that beginning. Sure. So I, uh, you know, eventually in, I think it was September of 2007, a box of 10 books arrived in my office, and this was my author package. And in fact, they were the only 10 physical books in existence because <laughs> I, I, I was self-publishing through a, uh, you know, a, pr- a published print-on-demand company. So if someone ordered it off, the, off of Amazon or Chapters, uh, they would spit out a single copy. And, and you know all about that. You had a print-on-demand uh, machine at uh, the Express, Espresso? The called? Espresso Book Machine, Espresso yeah. Espresso Book Machine at McMaster. So I, I was holding in my hand the only 10 copies that, I, that were in existence. And I immediately ordered a box of 48. Uh, I put the box of 10 underneath my desk, and the box of 48 arrived. I put them in the trunk of my car, and I, would, you know, I gave a few to family and friends, and then I would drive around to independent bookstores in in and around the Toronto area, and I would walk in with a few copies and ask them a bit sheepishly if they would consider selling this novel on consignment in their store. And some of them did, and and some of them didn't. Uh, But it was around that same time. It would have been the same time when I would be picking up the phone and calling you at uh, at McMaster. Uh, So it all happened then. And by the time we did the book launch, I think, at McMaster, which you kindly organized and and invited me to which was and an sold incredible out, sold out all the copies yeah there you go that's and it was it was amazing it was uh it was fun and to be there and to be signing your own book was uh well any first time writer uh it probably gets chills thinking about that and i still do when i remember that that day in in hamilton uh but by the time i got back to my i think it was literally the the day I got back to my office, the day after the, lo- the book launch, 
and I had exhausted my 48 books and I just looked underneath my desk and I saw the box of 10 copies there and I thought, what am I gonna do with, uh, with these? And just on a lark, flush from my triumphant book signing at McMaster, I went to the website of the Stephen Leacock Memorial Medal for Humor, one of our oldest literary awards that uh, uh, I know our heroes have, have won. Robertson Davies won, Mordecai Richler <clears throat> and others. And I just assumed it was like every other literary award that they would not accept self-published works. And I just went to the eligibility requirements just to check that. And lo and behold, there was no such limitation on the Leacock Medal, clearly an oversight on their part. <laughs> and, and I read a little further, I said they needed a, a, a check from the publisher for $100 as the entry fee. And I happened to have a check in my wallet because I was the publisher. Right? <laughs> And they needed a headshot of the author. I had that on my computer too. My twin brother had taken it of me for the book and it was sitting on my, you know, a JPEG on my desktop. And finally it said, and you must send the jury 10 copies of the novel. And I've told this story hundreds of times in the intervening years, but I am deadly serious when I say that had they required 11 copies, <laughs> you'd be interviewing another author today, Mark. I don't think... <laughs> I think my, my literary life would have, uh, would have been stillborn. Wow. But I, I had it ex exactly, and frankly, had they not been sitting in a cardboard box suitable for mailing, that could have thwarted the whole <laughs> enterprise as well. But I seemed to have everything that they needed. And I packaged it up. Uh, I, put it, I put the postage on it. For, you know, we have a little scale. You weigh it up and everything. And, the, and uh, I put it out on our front desk to t for the letter carrier to take away. And, and then I went back to my office and worked on a client memo and I got cold feet. And I said, what are you doing? You can't send your self-published novel into the Leacock medal. What are you thinking? And I went to pull it back and it had left about two minutes earlier. Oh. Uh, and I even went downstairs to see if I, he, I could catch the truck outside. And were it not for our temperamental elevators in our building back then, uh, I might have I might have stopped it, but I didn't. And you know, to make a long story <laughs> longer. Uh, anyway, uh, as as luck would have it, um, it it won the Leacock Medal that year, <laughs> and that's what instantly changed my life as a as a writer. <clears throat> so what what happened? Uh, you were nominated for the award, which was an honor, uh, well, and then well, won. And technically. <laughs> I nominated myself for the award because I entered my own book. In okay. The but there's a, still a short list that's published. Right. Then right. there's a short <laughs> list and that came out in March. And that may well have been the bigger shock actually was the short list because, you know, there were 48 books in the running and, you know, Douglas Copeland's novel, Will Ferguson's novel. He's a three-time winner. Arthur Black's new collection. He was a three-time winner at the time. And I, I, all these people I'd read and, and collected and revered, some of them were in the running for it. So I said, well, you know, that was fun while it lasted. And then I just happened to look the day I was in Montreal on business. And I read in the airport lounge in the Star, I think, that the Leacock shortlist was being announced that day at 1030 in Aurelia, the hometown of Stephen Leacock. And uh, in a break in this meeting I was, I was running uh, in Montreal, I just went on the website and I found a story from the Aurelia Packet and Times where they had, they posted it already and it was the, the shortlist, a story about the shortlist. And anyway, uh, there was my, there was my name uh, and the book title next to it. And I, I had to look several times and I may have had a minor stroke. I'm not sure it was, <laughs> it was something that was left me in a, some kind of a medical stupor uh, at the time. But, uh, and I have very little memory of the rest of the day. So I, we f I flew back to Toronto that night without really needing the plane. And, <laughs> <clears throat> and there was a, vo a voicemail waiting for me when I got home from the head of the jury saying, you know, you've been shortlisted. Congratulations. And that really, I think, marks the the beginning of of my of my real life as a <laughs> as a writer because th things moved uh pretty quickly after that yeah so after that um you uh you landed an agent 
Yep, within a week, I'd signed with an agent who was the one agent who had emailed me back from before. <laughs> uh, the only, because the only, it was the only you know, contact I had with a real agent was that one email. That really? So, so Bev was the one who yes. sent, sent the positive comment, which, which yes. never happens. For an agent no. or an editor to take the time to leave a comment means something huge, yes. right? which you and didn't I, know at the time. No, and, and I, I found the email trail from a year or so earlier. And I hit reply and I said, oh, you may not remember me, but the email trail is below. But this has just happened. And I put a link to the CBC story, I think it was, about the shortlist. Right. And I said, does, does this change anything? And I, and I wasn't being snide or right. uh, I was re- genuinely curious to know whether or not being shortlisted for a literary award like this would... Uh, give her pause to reconsider taking me on. And she said, let's have a, let's have a drink. <laughs> <laughs> and she did take me on. Bless her, because she is still my agent now, 10 years later. Wow. Uh, more than 10 years later. Um, which, even when I say that it's been 10 years, I still shake my head that it's been that long. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we got started, and we had sending out the manuscript to publishers and we had had a few rejections uh by the time a month had passed when they were in making the announcement of the winner of the leacock medal uh, but there were still plenty of irons in the fire and uh anyway that uh my wife nancy and i drove to Aurelia for the announcement of, of the winner i got to meet uh scott gardner who was the only other shortlisted author who could make it to the the luncheon and I was thrilled. I mean, I read his books. I picked his, one of his books for our book club two years earlier. So this was so cool that I was meeting a, a real author because I, I'd never really met another author before. And we had a good time. And then miraculously, my name was produced from the podium as the winner. And, uh, you know, within a week of winning, we signed with McClellan and Stewart, where I've been uh, ever since. Wow. So it really, you can trace it all in a way you can trace it back mark to the book launch at mcmaster because that made me feel so good that that was when i when i sort of surmounted the the obstacle of (laughs) i'm not even going to look at the leacock website why would i even go there Uh, (laughs) and yet i felt so good i said well maybe i'll just have a look and see whether they consider it Uh, so anyway it's been a an interesting road, but I am grateful for our, our earliest encounter because I think it had a, an influence on, on my life as a, as a writer in a very positive way. And you still have the contract I made you sign that said you would still talk to me after you became <laughs> That's right. right. That's still, I have a copy of, of it here. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> oh. but, but, then, but then, I mean, I mean okay, you're working on your seventh novel right now. You've yes. released uh, six novels with, um, with, Penguin Random House, McCollum yeah. and Stewart, which is an imprint of uh, Penguin Random House. And yet one more, one more big thing happened with the best laid plans that rarely happens to books. Um, yes, I guess that's true. And I, I, Canada Reads may have helped with that, but uh, it won Canada Reads in 2011, which I think probably contributed or helped create the climate that allowed it to be optioned for film and television. And it became a six part television miniseries on CBC and eventually a stage musical in Vancouver, which I mean, yeah, (laughs) I still sort of pinch myself about uh, all of that. Uh, That was uh, an extraordinary experience just because I, you know, I'd never been involved with a TV show and you, yeah. your natural curiosity about such things was, uh, you know, satisfied by the process. It was really fun. It was fun so, to be involved in. So you've gone from, you know, completely controlling the cover and the direction of the book and, and how it's going to look and feel to <laughs> yes. then having to hand over to yes. other people. Because you, you probably didn't have much say in the television program. Did no. you have any say in it at all? Well, I, I'll tell you what, uh, I, when, when, you, when you take the very modest check in Canada, at least for the (laughs) film rights, film and TV rights to the story. When you take that check, that literally means that that story in the film and TV world does not, no longer belongs to you. It belongs to somebody else. Um, But I did meet with the producer, the director beforehand and liked his vision of it. 
but they don't really want, I was officially a story consultant on, on the series, but they don't usually want the author that close to it. Right. Uh, because sometimes authors can be rather protective of their story. And I think it helped that I was a little later in life when all this happened to me. I was in my, at that stage, yeah, I was in my early 50s when that happened because uh, I started writing quite late. So I, I knew that the story was going to change and that right. they, they, they weren't going to casually toss my 100,000 word manuscript onto the screen without anything changing. Um, but they did send me uh, each of the episode's scripts uh, and asked for my comments. They were written by two of the finest TV writers uh, we have in the business. Um, oh my gosh, I've just lost her name. Uh, uh, she wrote Slings and Arrows. The uh, I'll, I'll think of her name. <laughs> and well, I'll put the link in the show notes to the yes, to the office. yes, yes. Isn't that terrible? I can't think of the name. Um, but she's the one who's written probably more successful TV in this country than anyone else. So who am I to, <laughs> to suggest anything else <laughs> that I should change it? But and I didn't comment. I only commented on the scripts. Not when the story changed from departed from the novel, because you know that's theirs. They can do that. That's their uh, their choice. I only commented when I thought the characters were doing things that were out of character. Right. right. And to my great uh, gratification, they always respected and reflected my comments in the next iteration of the of the script. Okay. And uh, there was a whole scene that was cut out because I just said. Angus, my character in the first novel, would not do that. He would not behave that way. Right. And they totally agree. Uh, and it was neat being on set. Where I was on set for three or four days of shooting. You were actually in it. You had a cameo, I saw, in the I last did, episode. I did have a cameo in the last episode, which they didn't tell me about when they said, can you come <laughs> back to Ottawa for one more visit to the set? And I I said, well, sure, I'm always happy to get out of the office and, and come up. And they said, make sure you bring a suit. And I thought we were going to go meet somebody. Right. I didn't know what they were on about. And, and anyway, and they, I was in the suit, and they dressed me up as a, as a newly elected uh, member of parliament. And it was, it was lots of fun. My phone has not been ringing off the hook for auditions after oh. this, <laughs> but... But it was really fun to be involved. And if you sneezed at the wrong time in the sixth episode, you'd miss it. But, uh, <laughs> but it's there. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was waiting to see if there was going to be an author cameo in every single episode. Right. Um, you know what? Having, having loved the novel, having listened to it, having read it, um, I thought they did a very fair and, and heart-filled adaptation that captured the essence of Angus yes. and, and the relationships. And, and I mean, it had all of the heartfelt moments. It had the funny... Um, brilliant, brilliantly done. So, um, but then you returned to Angus in a second book as well. You did the uh, yes. road. Yeah, I, I as soon as uh, the Leacock thing happened uh, for the first novel, I thought, you know, I, I think I'd like to try this again. It, it worked out pretty well, and it was fun. And and I thought it would be safest. I'd left the door open at the end of the best laid plans right. for a sequel if I wanted to write one, and uh, I didn't know that sequels tend not to sell as well and are more difficult to place and all that. Mm -hmm. But, but McClellan and Stewart was game and I did it and I really liked the second novel too. And uh, I had fun with that. And uh, you know, there's a bit of Canada U S relations in that novel. Uh, yeah. There's a visit by uh, the president of the United States. And I think because I'd written about Canada U S relations before and in my third novel up and down has some Canada U S stuff in it. You know, I actually got a call from the New York Times asking to in, to talk to me about Trudeau and Trump and winning the World Cup and what my thoughts were on that. I thought, well, <laughs> you write a couple of novels and that uh, qualifies you to talk about foreign policy. And anyway, it was uh, it was quite fun. But uh, yeah, so I uh, the high road was uh, I enjoyed that and it seemed to go well. But then I thought, you know. Let's see if I can write something that isn't uh, political satire per se. You know, let's see if I can do something slightly different. And that's when I went to move to the third novel, Up and Down, which is not about politics. Although there's a bit of there's politics in it, right. but it's not it's not set in that world. Yeah. Uh, 
so that was a lot of fun. I, and I've tried to sort of tackle issues that have been an interest to me, uh, of interest to me, uh, in some of the novels, and uh, yeah. and that's you know I think that's what what writers do. So I think uh, one of the things that I thought was kind of interesting and, and it was a theme that you returned to with Up and Down was the fish out of water, right? It was the, it was an 80 year old female astronaut, yes. right? I mean, absolutely inspiring, funny, uh, poignant. It, it had all the same sort of landmarks from a Terry Fallis novel. It had the, the humor, it was well-written, it had interesting characters, fish out of water, and then it had the poignancy, it had the touching yes. moments. It was the father, right? The missing father from the plane. Yes, the, that's right. The backstory. I was so much going on. Uh, and then, uh, I mean, I, I, I could talk for hours about all of your novels, um, but Pulls Apart was another one that you really touched upon women's rights. Right. And you really uh, t talked about feminism in a really amazing way. And, and obviously, the, and you, the play on words with the titles, right? The Pulls Apart because of the, <laughs> I don't know, I want to give away the, right. uh, but you know, it's both um, opposites as well as the, the pole itself in his apartment right. <laughs> and right. what it's attached to. Um, so why, you, you touch upon serious issues. Yeah. Uh, even though, even though you write humor and, and how does that, how does that dichotomy work for you as a writer? Well, I, I, I've come to, to, I've, I've learned, I guess, over the years that, that humor can be really serious stuff. Uh, and that humor can be a rather trenchant instrument of social comment if it's wielded, uh, skillfully, not that I'm all that skillful at it, but I'm aiming for that. Uh, and I think sometimes uh, when social issues are are under discussion, uh, anger and rage uh, and the protest march are the, the staples of social activism. And I sometimes think when we need to be convince a broader population uh, to get engaged, that the impact of rage and anger can be diminished through repetition and it just washes over us. Oh, there's yet another protest on Parliament Hill today. I'm not sure what cause it is, but you know, it's Wednesday. So maybe it's this, you know, yeah. and it just becomes a little almost, uh, it's just overdone. And I, I've come to realize that you can give people a different entry point to uh, social issues through satire, through humor. Uh, and they may not even realize that they're now thinking about these issues because you have uh, got them hooked on a story, you hope, that doesn't use all of the staples that social activism has leaned on for so many years. So, uh, and I think it's important for writers to write about things that interest them, that they're passionate about, that are important to them. And since my days at McMaster, when I had my own social awakening, as so many others did in the student movement, heavily involved with student politics on campus and uh, the national student movement. And feminism is a very important strand that runs through the, the national student movement. And I was, uh, I was a convert. To me, it remains the single most pervasive social injustice we have on the planet. Uh, and I, you can see it, I think, my interest in feminism lurking in the undergrowth of my other novels, but it is certainly front and center in, uh, in Poles Apart. But again, trying to get people to think about it while enjoying a story. And plenty of people would read the novel and just enjoy it as a story, I think, and maybe not uh, accept or embrace uh, the, you know, the, the issue underneath. <laughs> But I think other people, and I hope some people, gave passing thought to some of the issues I was trying to explore through this so-called funny novel. <clears throat> For sure, that was something uh, I did. I enjoyed the story itself. I enjoyed the characters, the development, but then it also really made me think, and, and, and I thought that was uh, interesting. I also remember that when the book was releasing, you were also sharing articles and uh, that, that were very pertinent to the underlying messages and themes. Oh, yeah. Which were just brilliantly done. I don't know if it was by accident or because you were thinking about them, but I thought that was great. The but last... The, oh. the only other thing I was going to add is I even put in, in that novel, right at the end, I put some a, a fact sheet about women in the world and women in Canada, right. uh, all cited from sources, which was my way of saying, you've just read a, a funny story 
but uh, this is actually a serious issue right. affecting people in right now. Uh, so I wanted to bring them back to reality. If they turned that final page and saw that, I think they would have been uh, troubled by the statistics that I uh, I laid out for them. So that was my way of trying to connect fiction with reality at the end. But, sorry, I, <laughs> and, I no, and, and drive that message home and say, <laughs> yeah. in case you missed it, <laughs> right, exactly. here's what I'm on about. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and then uh, uh, I, I'm going to ask about the new novel. But so run, one brother shy, your your last release uh, again, another brilliant play on words. <laughs> but <the> one uh, <laughs> introverted uh, brother, um, but you also. Also, you played on a technology there, and that was like this facial recognition software that the genius creates. Can yes. You a little bit about, uh, about that novel. Yeah, well, and I think it was probably inevitable that I would one day write a novel about identical twins because, and not everybody knows this, uh, or even many people know it, but I am an identical twin, so I could write about <laughs> that experience that is limited to so few of us in the world. I mean, identical twins, there are plenty of lots more fraternal twins, but... Right. I have, in a way, uh, not a unique experience, but certainly uh, a rare experience of, of being an identical twin. And I thought I would write a novel about that. Uh, but if I had written a novel, sort of an autobiographical novel, it wouldn't have been very interesting because I've had a, a rather charmed uh, life. Uh, you, you've and known your brother your entire life, too. I have. <laughs> and for some months before that, one might say. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, we were never afflicted with any of the problems and the challenges that uh, befell the, the narrator in that novel. So I had to cook up a different story. But at the core of it is you have I, the bond between uh, identical twins. Uh, I also there was something different about that novel. Uh, all of my other narrators have been flawed very in human ways they've been sort of a combination of helpless hapless and hopeless but they've been all good you know pretty good people and and i thought you know i i don't dare write yet another narrator who fall fits that mold <laughs> and i thought i wanted to challenge myself to write a narrator who was not just flawed in human ways but was actually damaged right uh, and uh, the incident in high school yeah. yeah the incident in high school which knocked this guy off his path in life and changed him quite fundamentally uh and i thought it would be interesting to try and write a character who suffered a trauma uh like that and uh so that's how it how that came about so i think of it as a funny novel of discovery and recovery uh discovery of of family members that he didn't know he had, uh, and recovery from this rather pivotal event early in his life, 10 years before the novel opens, uh, from which he ultimately emerges with the help of, of others around him. So uh, it was, there's a darker underside uh, to the story, uh, which challenged me as a writer. Uh, I mean, if I just, unless I forced myself, I would write another book <laughs> in the older style, my traditional <laughs> style, but I just wanted to push myself uh, a little bit. And uh, so, yeah, I'm fond of that novel, uh, but it is a, a, perhaps a little bit uh, different. Yeah, yeah, it was. It, it was. And, and you push yourself in really great ways because I really enjoyed that uh, as well. And they just keep getting better. And so the next one you're writing right now, you're I probably am. more than halfway through it. It's called If At First You Don't Succeed. Yeah, no, if at Can first, you? No, no, you haven't got that. It's, it's oh. If At First You Succeed. Oh, whoopsie, I already implanted yeah. there. I got it wrong already. So I, I, yeah. I didn't succeed the first time. <laughs> that's right, exactly. <laughs> and you, no, that's, you said, so, you, can you give us a teaser about this? Sure, sure. and you will, you will laugh when you find out uh, what it's about, given your comments about golf earlier on. Um, but it, it deals with, I think, a central issue that a lot of, uh, a lot of us have dealt with. Um, and that is, you know, we, we start a career early in our 20s. We land a job somewhere. And a door opens and we go through it and we start doing the job. We find out we're pretty good at it. Uh, we get promoted. We get raises. We get headhunted. 10 years, 15 years pass. You're at the top of your game. You're very good at what you do. Uh, but you don't get up on a Monday morning saying, yes, I can go into the office today. <laughs> uh, so it's a novel about uh, dealing with that issue that even though you may be really good at something, and in the case of my narrator, the very best in the world, it's not 
necessarily what we're supposed to be doing uh, or what is going to fulfill us or give us uh, the rewards that, that, that we are seeking. Uh, and it's just so easy just to keep going. Uh, so it's, uh, I use, uh, I've cooked up, and it's tough to explain this novel in, in a short period of time, but, but I, I've cooked up a, a new theory that I attribute to an obscure Swedish kinesiologist. And it's a theory I've actually had in, uh, growing up, I have thought about this often, that we, each of us has a body, a physical body, that is probably well-suited to succeed in at least one sport. Okay. And unfortunately, sometimes we don't discover what that sport is. And, you know, it could be that I might have been a uh, best-in-the-world high lie player if I'd ever tried high lie. Mm -hmm. But he cooks up this theory um, it involves the measurement of your arms and your legs and your forearm and your whole arm, and then a series of ratios of your one body limb against the other. And it's a big al computer algorithm that looks at your body types and then maps it against the major sports and who has succeeded in those sports and what kind of bodies do they have. And then it speculates more um, uh, and uh, speculates as to who, what would the ideal body be for that sport, even if nobody has yet come up with that body. And anyway, uh, this is written up in an obscure kinesiology journal. And the first day of the narrator's last year in high school, he's 17 years old, there's a brand new gym teacher. This is a homeroom teacher. And she's this kind of 50 something stocky, rather mannish woman uh, and uh, she's reading this this journal at her desk while the, everyone in the class is filling out their insurance liability forms to take home for their parents to sign for gym class and she starts looking reading this article and looking at at the, at the students and uh, eventually she ends up saying the very first sentence in the novel is would you mind if I measured your extremities <clears throat> And it goes on from there. And she measures a few of the, the guys' extremities. It's a boys' phys ed class. And, you know, the three athletes uh, who are already playing football and hockey uh, measure, score pretty well on the chart for hockey and, and, and football, but not off the charts. And then the narrator gets measured. And never before has anyone gotten above the 90th percentile a Gunnarsson number of 90. Gunnarsson is the, uh, uh, Ingmar Gunnarsson is the name of the kinesiologist. And the narrator measures in the 99th percentile for golf. In other words, he speculates uh, the best golfers in the world are only at about 85%, and they've got there by practice, 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 practice. Above the 90th, 90th percentile, the kinesiologist suggests that if you practice, you will get worse, that it's your natural swing, the way your body works together, so well-tuned is your body. And he's never played golf in his life, <laughs> isn't interested in the game, doesn't really like the game that much, but his gym teacher puts a five iron in his hands at a driving range and he hits it about 270 yards, dead straight, eventually. So to make a long story short, he becomes in quite short order, the best golfer uh, in the world. Uh, and I hope that the explanation for how he comes to be that is believable. Uh, right. I, I've tried hard for it to be believable. It sounds a bit far-fetched, but... And the problem is, all he's ever wanted to do is, is, is to write. He wants to be a, a writer. He's, okay. not a great, he's not a great writer. <laughs> That's what he wants. That's what he wants. So it's how we, there's a cataclysmic event in the middle of the novel, and then uh, it's, it's fun how he eventually uh, finds what he wants to really do with his, with his life. Uh, but that's, so that's hence the title, If at First You Succeed. Ah, okay. So. That's, thank you. That is awesome. I look forward to that. Now, so, so just uh, among the last questions I want to ask is we talked about the podcast. Then you sold the rights to uh, one, the world's largest publisher, the Canadian uh, arm of that. And yet this publisher 
is allowing you to do something that's very unconventional, um, which is actually release, begin to release the audio podcast that you are producing yes. prior to the book's release, I, which, which just seemed it's, it's, it's not done in the publishing yes. industry. How did that come about? Well, it, uh, that's a great question because it is a bit unusual. And I think we managed to persuade the powers that be, my publisher and editors at McClellan and Stewart, Penguin Random House, that we were going to sell more books if I continued on this path this, that I had started. Because I had built up, I think, you know, uh, maybe not huge in numbers, but geographically diverse in the country uh, right. and a, a lo rather loyal following. And in a, way, in a way, I felt such loyalty to them for helping me get that first novel published right. that I almost felt obligated to, uh, to keep podcasting. And they could have said no, of course, and I would have said, okay, well, that, that's that. But they, we persuaded them that it would be okay to do it and it would help. And they've allowed me to do it uh, for each of my novels. Now, one thing has changed, and that is that Penguin Random House has just started an audio division. Right. So I can't tell you right now that I'm going to, as I have for all the others, uh, podcast and give away for free the my seventh novel. Uh, we haven't had that discussion yet. <laughs> it, it may be that it becomes a Penguin Random House. Uh, right. So the, the, previous, uh, the previous releases have not been released in audio? So people can't benefit from just easily, you know, instead of subscribing and getting the weekly yeah. feeds, they can't just easily go and buy the Terry Follis readings of the... Not that, not that I'm aware of. No, that, there, there isn't like an audible version or uh, uh, Penguin Random House hasn't released them. Oh, as, really? I'm surprised because they're, they're high quality. You've got great yeah. music, um, yeah. great introduction. I, I love the introductory bits you do for each chapter. So you just talk a little right. bit. There's the introductory narrator, some professional narrator dude, probably. Oh, yeah. I love my voiceover guy played ball hockey with him. Yeah, and he's got a great voice. He and does I, love that. I love the music you pick and why you pick right. it. And, and there's, this, there's this intimacy. And now I know you and I know each other, but there's this yes. great intimacy that I have when I listen to your novels. I was like, I can hear Terry. I can feel it. And right. I love that I'm, it, it frustrates me, but I'm waiting week to week for the yeah, yeah. to come. And, and that's how <laughs> I, and that's why well, I think I, I binged listened to because <laughs> most of it was out by the time I it got was out it. by then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, that's curious. I'm curious to see what happens and I will be following that uh, and sharing information on the podcast as to what happens. But I'm thinking, Hey, if they want easy audiobooks where they can just package them, uh, right, they they're already, already there. They have all the great audio files <laughs> done. They're done. They have the complete Terry Follis library. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that's true. So I don't know what's going to happen with the new one. We'll, we'll see. Uh, I mean, I do like producing it, but it is, it, it takes a lot of time once you're in oh, yeah. that, as you know, producing a podcast, uh, you know, to read a half hour long chapter and then stick the music on and do the editing and cut out all of my coughs and my botched words and, <laughs> uh, so that it sounds like it's done in one pristine take, which you it never it is. Uh, it, it does take, you know, two or three, three or four hours a, a week to do it when I'm in recording mode. Right. But, you know, but I've enjoyed doing that very much. And it has, I think, uh, I think it's been helpful to me uh, as, as a writer. Now, has that, has that actually benefited you when you're, when you go to uh, do a book event where you actually are doing a reading? Has that actually helped that experience or are you I just more so. nervous in front of people? I think, well, I, I'm, I'm quite comfortable in front of, I mean, being in the business that I've been in for 30 years where I'm often presenting to boardrooms or, or bigger venues uh, I, I'm mercifully, I'm quite comfortable in front of, uh, in front of a crowd. And that's such an important part of being a, a successful writer in this day and age is being able to stand up and, and engage an audience, uh, and make them like you and like the book and, and buy the book. <laughs> so I, I've been very fortunate, but certainly reading the, the doing recording the podcast has helped me to pick which sections I'm going to read for my public readings. And it, frankly, reading it aloud, as you will know, Mark, is uh, such a great way to help you with editing because some sentences that sound pristine in the confines of your own head uh, do not sound quite so pristine uh, when you read them aloud. And so it's a great editing exercise, I think, to read your work aloud. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, it, it certainly is. Now, uh, last sort of question 
uh, is you have a really strong relationship with booksellers. Um, and when you go, I, I'm, you know, you, you make really easy friends with booksellers and they just adore having you in. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that experience and why that's important for an author? Well, I, it's, I am so grateful to the booksellers, particularly the independent booksellers, uh, because they have helped me get to where I am. Uh, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't be writing my seventh novel had they not, uh, I think, supported me. Uh, so uh, whenever I go to a small community or any community uh, for a reading, which I do, I do a, quite a bit of, I always, I mean, people say, why don't you just buy some books? Think of the margin. You could buy your books off your own <laughs> publisher and you could make, a, you know, a 50% return on them. Right. But I always uh, call up the local bookseller and ask them if they would like to come and, and sell books at the event. And they're almost always, very rarely do they say, well, no, not really. I don't think that's ever happened. Actually. <laughs> but, you know, and so I, I do, I'm grateful for their support when they show up and they, they lug, you know, all my backlist and they, uh, and they stay and they sell and I sign and then I sign their stock that doesn't sell. Uh, so they'll have it went back in the store. And it's just part of the essential infrastructure of the publishing world and a writer's life in this country and in every other country. So I am, I am in their debt and, you know, they may, maybe they love me, but I love them because, <laughs> because they allow me to, to do what I love to do, which is to write more books. It, it's definitely a co-beneficial relationship. Absolutely. And as is. a bookseller who used to sell your books <laughs> on a regular <laughs> basis. Um, exactly. And then, and then very final question um, uh, related uh, specifically for writers, because you probably get this all the time from, from people who saw, well, I waited, you waited till later in life, you gave it a shot at writing and, and you've had some, you've had some okay success. I think you've done a couple things. You got, you know, a book or two out, a few <laughs> handfuls of awards, TV show kind of stuff. <laughs> but um, what's, what's the, what's your favorite advice that you share when an author asks, well, you know, where do I get started? How do I, how do I do this? Yeah, that, that's a great, and there's, there's a, a, a few pieces of, of advice. One of them uh, is something that I have followed, generally followed in, in all of my books. Uh, and I think we can, write with greater authenticity if we're writing in a voice that we know really well. Uh, and anyone who knows me and has read my books will find a striking similarity between my voice and the voice of my narrators. And there are you know, five different narrators across six current books and a seventh coming out. Uh, so I, I find it, I don't, I tend to try and write someone who sounds a little bit like me. I am not the person. I am not them, and they behave differently in some, in some instances. But the voice, it's a voice with which I am very familiar, uh, and I think that that's, uh, that's helpful. And the second thing I would say is, for crying out loud, write something that you care about. Uh, if, if vampires are all the rage right now, don't write a vampire novel because of that. Uh, if you love vampires, by all means. But I, I, I remember meeting a writer and I, who was an, a, an aspiring writer, and, and she said, yes, I'm writing a novel about vampires because they're so hot now. It was, this is in the, in the rise of twilight. Yeah. And, and I said, oh, uh, do you, uh, are you interested in vampires? No, not really. Uh, and do you know much about them? No, not yet, but I'm researching them now. And uh, do you know any vampires? No. Are you a vampire? No. Are you touched in any way by vampires? No. And so I, my, I could only imagine the challenge it would be to write a book that feels real and powerful, compelling, authentic, when there is no connection at all between the subject matter and the writer beyond the marketing imperative right. of uh, the high profile of vampires at that moment in time. So when people said, why would you write a satirical novel of Canadian politics? That sounds like a terrible idea. And maybe it was, but at least it was something I cared about, I knew about, I'd lived in that world, I had some views on it, and I had a story I wanted to tell to illuminate a different path we might take in how we practice politics in this country. And I think it's hard to write your best work when you're not writing about something that you, you care about. 
Awesome. Uh, you know what? Excellent <laughs> words of wisdom to end the podcast. Uh, please let our listeners know uh, where they can find more Terry Follis. Where online can they find, can they hear about you? Can they buy your books? Yes, well, I'm, I'm certainly uh, on the internet at terryfollis.com. I'm on Twitter at Terry Follis. Uh, I have a, an author Facebook page called, strangely enough, Terry Fallis, as, as opposed to Terry H. Fallis, which is my personal Facebook okay. page. Uh, and I think I'm, I am on, on Instagram, though I am a bit uh, lackadaisical in, <laughs> and infrequent in my posting. Uh, but that's an important part of the world. And I, I right now is, uh, the social media space and connecting there. So I do have a digital footprint that I try to keep up to date on pretty well. Well, thank you so much for hanging out with me today, Terry. Always a treat. Mark, it was great to hang out with you. Sorry. I was so long winded. That's a, an occupational hazard. Not at all. <laughs> uh, great value in everything that you shared. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Now, because I already spent some time reflecting in the opening personal update section, I'm going to make this reflection quick, or relatively quick. We're already well over an hour into the episode. Um, but first, there's so many things that I got out of this chat with Terry. So many things I could discuss that made me think, but I, I want to go with this quick one, or relatively quick one, and it relates to what I'm about to say. Thank you to those of you who filled out the survey that I announced in last week's episode. I'm getting some great feedback that's going to help me make the podcast better for you. And a quick call out to Rook. I hope you enjoyed this chat with Terry. Thanks to all of my Patreon supporters. I appreciate you taking the time to support the show and to let me know you value it enough to provide financial support. I hope the extra content I'm providing you is as valuable as you are to me. And thanks to those who took the time to leave a review of the podcast. I was surprised and delighted to notice a number of reviews posted out there and so absolutely flattered. Thanks for taking the time to do that. It really does help. But thanks especially to you right now for listening to this show. I really, truly hope that you find value in the conversations and reflections that I share. And I do absolutely appreciate you. And that leads into the final reflection for this podcast. In our chat, Terry talked about many of those little things that led to each step in his unorthodox journey through publishing. You know, how a comment from an agent or feedback from a podcast listener or a kind gesture from a bookseller made a huge difference in his own author journey, in his confidence, etc., Earlier, I reflected on the critical importance that a comment or two from a reader made to me that could turn a sour situation into something really positive. It's those small things. You're a creative person listening to this podcast. I imagine that the people who listen to this podcast tend to be creative people. So you likely understand the critical value of such things. So I'm assigning you homework this week. <laughs> In the next week... I don't care when it is you're listening to this, but in the next seven days, try to make a concerted effort to take the time to acknowledge something that you've gotten value from as a person, as a consumer, a reader, whatever. Maybe it's just someone in your life that did something positive that you want to acknowledge. Maybe it's a book you enjoyed. Maybe it's an article or a blog post. Maybe it's a song, a poem, a piece of art. Someone you bump into in your daily activities. Maybe it's a beautiful picture shared on Instagram or a funny cartoon or a joke shared on Facebook. It doesn't matter if it's physical or digital, whatever it is. Just make an effort to acknowledge the positive difference that that thing, whatever it was, made for you. It might just be a nod or it could be to the person that you responded to, that you acknowledged. That one little thing that makes a huge difference to them. Give it a shot. It, it can't hurt. And you never know how in the long run it might just help. So thanks again for listening to the show. Know that I adore the fact that you're on the other end listening to this. And I truly do value you being there. If you feel that I brought you value in some way, see what you can do to spread that value on or pay some value forward to the next person. No matter how small, it can make a huge difference. The world becomes better through small, kind gestures, and you make the world better with those little things that you contribute. So that's it for this episode. 
and I recognize it went really, really long. I do hope that the overtime of this episode uh, was well worth it for you. And until next week, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomtech.com.